All right, hello everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for February the 7th, 2022. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Tim and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python that's designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, CircuitPython de development is primarily funded uh, by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. The meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. The meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar that you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We'll also send out notifications for the upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive those notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes doc that accompanies the meeting uh, and recording. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, uh, so you can use the doc to view parts that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so this gives you the option to skip around. After each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting's notes documents to the CircuitPython dev channel in the Discord. Check out the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read for you during the meeting. The meeting will be held in five parts. The first part is community news. This will be a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. And it's a preview of the uh, lovely Python on microcontrollers newsletter, which comes out typically on Tuesdays. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers and separate it out from what uh, specifically we're all up to. Um, the next part uh, is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things that folks are doing, take time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to, uh, take a few minutes to talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the previous meeting and what you'll be up to in the next week uh, until the next meeting. And the fifth and final part is in the weeds. This is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be identified ahead of time as something that would be too long for status updates. Uh, so that covers how the meeting will go. Uh, with that, we will get going on community news. I will take first timestamp. Let me get scrolled up here a little bit. All right, so we've got a couple of items from community news this week. The first one being uh, the Raspberry Pi OS 64-bit is now out of beta. Over the past year, Raspberry Pi has been trialing a beta of the Raspberry Pi OS 64-bit, and last week it finally came out of beta. Uh, there is a link there to raspberrypi.com if you want to learn more about that. Next up, uh, our own Adafruit Discord channel has reached 33,000 members. Um, the Adafruit Discord community, where we do all of our Python development in the open, has reached over 33,000 humans this week. Uh, so thank you to everyone who has joined. Adafruit believes Discord offers a unique way for Python on hardware folks to connect. Uh, you can join today at adafru.it slash discord. Uh, see the announcement post with a chart of the server growth, and that is uh, posted on the Adafruit blog. Uh, next up is a CircuitPython pull request, which was added recently by Kmatch. This gives us the ability, uh, excuse me, uh, it exposes the CircuitPython's REPL's display group elements and allows for relocation of the REPL uh, in the serial terminal, as well as uh, opening up possibilities for things like split screens um, without breaking the existing display IO structure. So this, I think, is something I'm very excited about. This, I think, will be a very uh, neat way to help folks learn about the basics of Display.io. So check out a uh, link there to Twitter, and there is also a link to the specific PR on GitHub. Uh, and this is also merged in now, so if you're interested in that, you can try it out yourself. Next up is Piku. This is a small command line utility for managing CircuitPython projects. With Piku, you can uh, 
With Piku, you can make creating CircuitPython projects, installing packages, deploying, and connecting to a CircuitPython device easy from the command line. There's links here to the Adafruit forms, as well as the official listing on PyPy. Next up is the CircuitPython 2020 wrap-ups. Uh, thank you to everyone who wrote CircuitPython 2022 posts. Uh, we had 24 folks who posted uh, that were in the wrap-up, so thank you to uh, all of the folks who posted, thank you for all of your different ideas. Uh, hope that the excuse me. I hope that folks collaborate to make these ideas a, re a reality. And thank you to those whose ideas have been the guiding principles over the years. We would not be here without you. Uh, as Katni pointed out in her CircuitPython 2022 post, uh, don't hesitate to let us know what you'd like to see from CircuitPython and the community throughout this year. Feel free to give us more ideas on the Adafruit Discord, uh, Adafruit Forums, or the GitHub Issues section for the CircuitPython project. And again, there's a link there to the Adafruit blog to read that wrap-up post. A uh, couple more here from around the web. We have a Wordle game for the Clue. Um, so we are expecting a number of these uh, ports of this new Wordle game that has gained popularity. It's a New York Times word-based game. And we have one project this week on the Clue, which was ported over by Michael Lecoq. And it is uh, it runs on the Clue on CircuitPython 7, and it can actually uh, run both with and without a keyboard. So that's very interesting. Um, another one we have here are a couple KB2040 powered keyboards. Um, there are The first two are concepts that minimize finger movement. Um, and these run CircuitPython. It has some five-way switches instead of traditional key switches. Uh, I thought that was very interesting. And the other one is a split keyboard, which uh, also uses the Adafruit KB2040 microcontroller. And this one runs the PRK firmware based on Pico Ruby. Uh, and there are links to those uh, from Reddit and Twitter, respectively. Uh, so that wraps up community news. I will mention all of these items and many more came from the CircuitPython weekly newsletter. This is a community-run newsletter emailed out every Tuesday. The complete archives are available online at adafruitdaily.com. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or projects, edit this week's draft on GitHub. Uh, there is a link in the docs to there. Uh, so you can create a, a PR to that repository. You can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter, or you can email cpnews at adafruit.com. Uh, and to wrap it up, I will just mention um, thank you to Anne, who generally is the one writing and running the newsletter, keeping everything running and giving us a steady stream of great things to look at on Tuesday mornings. So thank you to Anne for that. Next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. So I will read... Uh, the overall state, and then we'll dive into the core and the libraries and Blinka. Um, so let me take a timestamp here and I'll read overall. So this week overall, we had 49 pull requests merged by 22 authors. Uh, a couple of names that I don't recognize as being uh, regular authors were uh, Fabaf, uh, S. Gauche, Stone Hippo, Andy Piper, uh, Life Imaging Services, uh, BRT Chip, uh, Chuan Yin, I'm going to guess on the pronunciation, I may be uh, incorrect on the last one there, um, and Walsh HBP, or uh, Walsh BP, I should say. Uh, so thank you to those folks who, again, um, I don't think they are regular contributors, or if they are, they haven't contributed in a little while. Um, and of course, thank you to everyone else who contributed as well. Uh, we also had uh, eight reviewers this week, um, so thank you to them. Um, and we had 30 closed issues by 11 people, and 25 issues were opened by 19 people. Um, so I will pass it over to Scott to tell us about the core. Hello. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so the stats for the core, we had 21 pull requests merged from 16 different authors. I won't highlight the new folks uh, since Tim did that already. Um, so thank you to everybody uh, who authored stuff. We had three reviewers, so as always, remember that uh, reviewers tend to be the bottleneck for bringing in more authors. So if you're interested in doing reviewing for the core, please reach out to us. We'd ha be happy to get folks ramped up for that. Uh, issues wise, are, or we have eight open pull requests, so we're actually doing pretty good keeping up. Uh, but three of those are, are over 100 days old. 
Uh, issues wise, we had 14 closed issues by six people and 11 opens by 10 people. So we're net down three, which is good. So thank you to all those folks that were involved. Uh, for a total of 498 issues. So we're up uh, right about 500. So we, we are slowly increasing. It's not the end of the world. Um, the way that we tra keep track of prioritization is through milestones. Uh, and we have uh, eight open issues for 8.0, 23 open for 7XX, which are issues that we should probably fix sooner rather than later. And then we have 11 open issues for 7.2.0, which are things that we think we should do by 7.2. Um, although we should probably do a pass for this before 7.2. There's possible that we don't need all of that. Um, and then we have 433 open issues. So that's where we are on issues and the milestones, and that's it for the core. All right, thanks, Scott. And now I will turn it over to Katni to tell us about the libraries. Oh my gosh, if I can click the right button. Um, so this section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a couple of extras. We had, over the course of last week, we had 28 pull requests merged by 10 different authors and eight reviewers. Um, of those pull requests merged, three of them were over two weeks old. One of them was 255 days, so I'm very excited to see that we're still getting through those older PRs. Uh, and the rest were zero or one, so it's excellent to see that we're keeping up. And that's leaving us with 21 open pull requests, which is definitely the lowest it's been in a long time. We had 16 closed issues by seven people and 13 opened by 10 people, leaving us with 635 open issues. It's good to see the number of people that have been involved in opening and closing these issues. Um, it, the, the number of issues open and closed is, is, in my opinion, less important than the number of people who have been involved. It's great to see so many people. Uh, 227 of those issues are good first issues. If you're looking to contribute to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including open pull requests and open issues. If you'd like to get started reviewing, check out the open pull requests. If you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, take a look at the code. Let us know what you think. That always helps. Um, if you're interested in contributing code or documentation, check out the issues. If you're new to everything, search for good first issue. Um, we have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're always available on Discord to help you out. We want to see you be able to contribute in a way that works for you. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had one new library, uh, CircuitPython HTTP server, and uh, a massive list of updated libraries from a recent patch. Um, I'm fairly sure literally every library was on the list and that's why it's not listed here. So I'm not gonna read that off. There is a link to the report though, if you're interested in seeing a giant list of libraries. Um, and that's where we are with the libraries. All right, thanks, Katni. Uh, and now I will turn it over to Melissa to tell us about Blinka. Hello, for this week, uh, for Blinka, we had no pull, requ we had no pull requests merged. Um, there are currently five open pull requests amongst all the repositories. There were zero closed issues, um, and there was one open by one person. There are currently 70 open issues, and there were 17,187 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month, and we are currently supporting 87 boards. And that's it. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, so that rounds out the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka. And next up, we will have the Hug Reports section. Hug Reports is a chance for us to highlight the folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. As mentioned, this section is held as a round robin where I will start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically. Um, we no longer circle back to the top, so we'll just go down that list. Again, this is in the notes doc. Um, if you're text only or you're missing the meeting, uh, but you do have Hug Reports in the notes document, then I'll read them off as we get to your time in the list. Uh, so I will start it out for Hug Reports. Let me timestamp it. Um, so this week I have Hug Reports for Scott, who discovered and shared uh, a direct link for um, the James Webb Telescope data uh, straight from NASA. Originally we had a third-party service that was scraping that data and returning it back to us, and now uh, we have a link that we hope to be able to just pull the data from directly. Um, so thank you to Scott. Uh, thank you to Katmi, Katni, who helped me get prepared uh, to run this meeting. Um, so huge thanks for that. Probably would not be here today without Katni's help. So thank you there. 
um, to Neurodoc and Anik Data, who both helped troubleshoot an issue fetching data from that NASA uh, URL. I uh, appreciate the help from both of those folks. And then uh, my last drag report is for Kmatch, uh, who worked on a way to split the screen between serial and REPL, uh, the serial REPL and the output from Display.io. That way we can have both showing, uh, which I, again, think is a really super neat uh, functionality. So thank you to Kmatch. And with that, I will pass it over to Dan. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, thanks to you for running your first meeting. Um, thanks to Dave Putz, who tracked down a PIO issue on RP2040 that was, uh, had to do with the order of arguments that is important to fix. Uh, thanks to Life Imaging Services, who submitted a really nice first PR, which is adding uh, the CRC32 CRC checksum to bin ASCII without um, having to drag in um, uh, Zlib, which was where the implementation was originally, but we just factored out that part of it. And now we have this other uh, nice checksum thing added. And thanks to Naradoc, who went through all the boards and added uh, stem, board.stemma.i2c to all the boards that have a stemma connector. That's really nice. And that's going to be a great thing to get into the next uh, version of CircuitPython. OK. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, next up, then, is going to be Jeff. All right, hello. Uh, well, I hope to you, Fummy Guy, for being the meeting host and generally stepping up on, on all things CircuitPython. I hope you had fun saying sponsored by Adafruit uh, in the intro, because that was uh, that's exciting also. Um, to a GitHub user, JWF McLean, for bringing up a really interesting bug report about timekeeping on SAMD51. To Noe and Pedro for the 3D models of Adafruit products, one came in handy this weekend. To Katni, I have a hug report for providing some slides and outlines for intro to CircuitPython presentations. And of course, a group hug. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up is Jerry. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a group hug for me. Excellent. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, next up is Katni. All right, so first up, I have a hug report for Carter and Naradoc for helping me get Enumerate going in two examples I was writing when Pylint complained. I've not worked with Enumerate previously, and I uh, was in a bit of a time crunch, um, so I didn't have time to put in the effort to actually go through learning it myself. Um, and the two of them helped me get it going and actually explained it in a way that I understood, so bonus there. Um, to Naradoc for adding the stemma underscore i squared c and stemma underscore i squared c1 to all applicable boards in CircuitPython. This is super amazing. At the moment, we have to have commented out code for every single board that has um, SCL1 and SDA1 uh, on the stemma QT connector. And um, this will make it so we won't have a whole list of boards in all the examples. It'll just be um, one or the other. And stemma i squared c will. Um, work on all boards that have a connector, even though it's the same as the pins. Uh, so that um, maps to the same thing. Uh, but it's still, it's good for consistency, because then if you're using the stemma connector, it's stemma. So hopefully that will clarify a lot of things for people. Um, to you, Tim, for running the meeting for the first time. Congratulations, and thank you very much. Uh, to TechTrick for figuring out how to automate fixing a library readme blender. That was totally my fault. Um, I had uh, one of our people add, um, another documentation section, not realizing we had a documentation section already. So it has different stuff under it. And the fix is to move that stuff under the current documentation header. So we're not duplicating things. Um, but it was not something that we could do with our current patch system because it involved moving a whole chunk of text that into a, you know, section that was already existing. Um, anyway, Tectric figured out how to automate it. So I'm really looking forward to being able to fix that and not waste a bunch of, uh, Eva's time, and a group hug. All right, thanks, Katni. Uh, next up is Kmatch. Hey, thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks to you for the uh, weekend stream on the Winamp player. Especially excited when your refactor basically worked the first time. So <laughs> that was that was exciting. Um, thanks, Scott, uh, uh, for the code suggestions and Foamy Guy for your encouragement, and also the stream last week on the split screen REPL. Uh, thanks on the forum, Discord forums, to Ed Keys and Mad Bodger for, for helping me identify the specs on a TFT display. And lastly, to Mark uh, Gamblor for a uh, heads up on a possibility of using keyboard input library uh, that's existing 
as a first step towards converting touchscreen touches to gestures. Thanks. Interesting. Thanks, Kimmich. Uh, next up is Maker Melissa. I want to give a hug report to you, Fummy Guy, for running your first meeting and a group hug to everyone else. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, and thanks to everyone who has uh, given me hug reports today. I appreciate, uh, appreciate all of you. Um, next up, we have Mark Gambler, who is missing the meeting today, so I will read them. So their first hug report is for Scott for finishing all the reviews of the IS31 PR that's finally done and pointing me, uh, pointing me to uh, getting, uh, excuse me, pointing to some getting to getting started information for debugging with GDB. Uh, next up, Mark has a hug for Katni for helping set up uh, to write some instructions on how to use it. Uh, helping me set up, write some instructions. I'm not sure, I guess, what the uh, help them how to use what, but uh, thank you nonetheless from Mark to Katni. And then uh, a hug report, they have the last one here is for me uh, for hosting the meeting. So thank you for that as well, Mark. Um, and next up, I will pass it over to Tammy Makes Things. Thanks. So I have a hug report this week for the, the PQ tool that we talked about earlier. Um, it's really helping me to solve some of the challenges I've had with my own development workflow. I have a hug report for the shipping and logistics folks at Adafruit for getting some stuff out to me amazingly quickly this week in spite of the absolutely banana crackers weather that's happening on the East Coast. And then a hug to everybody for being amazing and making community more than just an empty platitude in the CircuitPython community. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Timmy. Uh, next up, we have Scott. Hello. Uh, to echo the, the chorus of thank yous, uh, thank you, Foma Guy, for joining the, the meeting host rotation. Uh, it's particularly helpful to me considering that I will be out for a while this year. Uh, so it's nice to have another person in rotation. So thank you for, for hopping on board. Uh, and thank you to Katni for getting uh, Foamy Guy all ramped up. It's uh, super helpful. So thank you, Katni, as well. And lastly, a uh, hug report to Scooter for digging into CircuitPython on, on the STM32. They already uh, updated the library references and stuff. So that was really helpful. So thank you, Scooter. All right. Thanks, Scott. And uh, next up, I will read the notes for TechTrick. Uh, Tektrick has a hug report. Thank you to Foamy Guy and Neerdoc for help uh, helping debug an issue with the HT16K22 uh, pull request that was allowing the use of custom characters on seven segment displays. And Tektrick also has a group hug for everyone. Uh, so thank you to them. And next up is uh, V923Z Zoltan. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank um, Dan for his uh, very generous help uh, <clears throat> regarding uh, an automated firmware compilation system. This is something I, I have been trying to set up for MicroPython and, and uh, MicroLab and um, asked him whether he would uh, uh, would care to share his, his insights. And um, um, I was hoping for something like five minutes uh, of discussion time, and he gave me 25. So uh, many thanks for that. And uh, second, I would like to thank Jeff for uh, reviewing MicroLab code and catching a number of, of uh, silly errors, or perhaps not silly errors, but in any case, um, they have been caught. Thanks for that, Jeff. All right. Thank you, Zoltan. And thank you, everyone else, uh, for reading Hug Reports today. Um, that is, it brings us to the end of the hug report section. So next up will be status updates. Uh, and as a reminder, status updates, this is our time to sync up on what we're doing. This section is also held as a round robin where I will start and we'll go through the list alphabetically again. Um, when I call on you, take a couple of minutes, talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you, be, what you will be doing until the next meeting. Uh, this is also an opportunity to provide ticks and tips and tricks that are relevant to what people are working on. And if a discussion becomes too much for status updates, then we can move it down to in the weeds. Uh, with that, I will get started. Uh, so my status updates. Uh, this past week, I finished up the bulk of the work uh, on the functionality of the Winamp project code. Um, both the, uh, the code that runs on CircuitPython as well as some code that runs in CPython that converts the existing... Uh, Winamp themes over to be the right size and uh, exports a couple of the colors and things for us to use on the CircuitPython side. Um, I will be working on the guide for that this week. 
Uh, I have been continuing uh, testing and reviewing the PRs. Uh, one of the ones that I found particularly interesting this week was uh, my first time using a camera with CircuitPython. It's a VC0706 camera that has a uh, UART interface that talks back and forth to the CircuitPython device. And there was a uh, PR that was created to enable um, motion sensing that I guess is built into that camera. It had a way for you to uh, check whether or not it sensed motion between the previous frame and the current one. Um, so that was a neat addition, and uh, I kind of got up to speed using cameras this week in order to test it out. Um, I just streamed some uh, basics of Display.io on Thursday evening. If folks are interested, there's a VOD out there on YouTube. Uh, and in particular, I was looking at the new split screen functionality that allows us to show the REPL and Display.io at the same time. So if folks are interested in seeing what that's all about, there's a video out there. Um, some other things uh, that I was doing in the previous week was absorbing everything needed to run this meeting. I must have gone through the script. Uh, you know, half a dozen times or so and got everything, um, trial runs and stuff. So that's uh, been something I've been doing this week. And then uh, something that I do hope to do coming up for the next week is troubleshoot uh, an SSL error that we are uh, getting when we try to fetch data uh, from that NASA URL for the web telescope. So I have a, a note in the weeds to maybe uh, discuss that a little further if anyone is um, up on SSL stuff. Um, but that rounds out my status updates, so I will pass it over to Dan next. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I fixed some couple of bugs. Um, there were some I2C problems on ESP32-S2 uh, that were solved by using a, um, an internal routine in the ESP-IDF. Um, and that routine, we really needed to be able to call when we did do it, did a combined uh, write read I2C transaction, we needed to be able to call that wrapper routine. So we made a new common how routine to do that. And I put that in all the relevant um, I2C implementations and did a lot of testing. Like I built a whole bunch of things that I'd never built before, like Spresence, or that I hadn't built for a long time, and tested it on a whole bunch of platforms. Um, there was a, um, a PR that had broken the SAMD build, and I fixed that. Um, that's both of those were last week. I worked on a um, web server library recently that runs on the ESP32 S2. We had one that ran on the uh, Airlift breakout and Airlift boards, but not on the ESP32 S2. So now there's a simple um, new library called uh, Adafruit circuit python uh, http server it's just in version 0.1.0 you can find it in github uh, try it out and if you have some suggestions um, make some suggestions and eventually it will be in the bundle but it's not in the bundle right now it also works in c python so that uh, you could easily transfer some code back and forth uh, in line with that i'm starting to um, look at how to make a, an async um, web client library. Uh, after looking at a bunch of these libraries, I think I'm going to use the asks library, which is kind of a joke on the requests library, um, which is, a ver it's ba asks is basically a version of requests that does things in an async way. And I'll start with that and see how it works out. Probably I will also go back and make the HTTP server library have uh, async capability as well. And then there's still plenty of bugs to fix for the various 7.x uh, releases. Also, I don't have written write this down, but I did, I'll add it is that it would be nice to make another alpha release soon, like maybe this week, with considering all the changes that we have so far. Okay, that's it. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is Jeff. Hello again. So uh, last week, floppies and PIO somehow took all week, and it still isn't wrapped up. The state of the code is that uh, reading with the PIO peripheral, that is reading the data off of a floppy disk, uh, it's working great in Arduino, but it still needs tidying. And then reintegration with um, the code Lamore has been working on for the M4 microcontrollers. And uh, one reason that that took all week is that I also spent a lot of time on a silly 3D printing project that I will be bringing to show and tell. Um, it's not original, but I think 
my version of this 3D printed project brings something a little different and more than the original. So I'll have fun showing that off. Um, this week, uh, this is a question mark at the end. Really wrapping up RP2040 floppy reading and writing with PIO this week? I hope so. Um, and in coming weeks, I have been asked to speak at an upcoming hybrid event hosted by the Dublin Linux Users Group with details to come. So um, I don't know how y'all could attend, but I think there's a sign up and I'll share that info when I get it. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up is Jerry. Yeah, I, ho I hope your part involves going to Dublin to do it. That'd be fun. Um, so I um, <laughs> I re responded to a question that came in the forum, and this is another example of really cool things that come out of forum questions. Um, <laughs> so somebody was trying to use the RFM 9X library to communicate with the um, Arduino LoRa library. And we're asking if it, if, it, if it could work. And my first reaction was, yeah, I'd never even heard of the Arduino LoRa library. I've always used Radiohead. And so I went and took a look at it. And um, it turns out it actually, if you just do a basic or simple test, it works great. Um, um, the problem is your, the, uh, that library um, doesn't use the Radiohead headers that we use on the CircuitPython side. But, but um, it just sends a string of bytes. So if you build a header in the beginning of your packet, it works fine. Um, they were trying to transmit to a to a, um, a Raspberry Pi running the CircuitPython library. And, and it all worked great with the default settings. The problem was this user wanted to tweak some of the settings to use, change the spreading factor on the, um, on the um, library to try and increase their, their throughput. And things fell apart, didn't work at all. And so I started looking into it more and realized that all of the, almost all of the use that we do in CircuitPython with, with the libraries and with Radiohead use the same spreading factor. The spreading factor of seven is the defaults used for uh, um, you know, all the standard communication. And it works very nicely. Um, and a couple of other spreading factors, eight, nine, and 10 work okay too. But six, 11, and 12, which are really more special cases, didn't work at all. And looking at the code, it, probably it makes sense that they don't work because there's a lot of special handling you have to do for those those spreading factors that isn't being done in, in, in our code, in the CircuitPython code. So um, that definitely needs to be fixed. Problem was I couldn't make it work even when I thought I was fixing it. So there's a, a lot of understanding to dig into the data sheets and try and understand it. So I'll be, I'll be working on that as time allows. Uh, fortunately, it seems to be a pretty seldom come across problem, but it certainly is is a, is a problem. Um, and so if anyone else has come across that or looks at, wants to <laughs> dive in, let me know, or just dive in and see if you can understand any of it. Then um, I did try the new 64-bit um, Raspi OS, um, and it's off to a good start and trying some things with it. And I tried Blinka, and the first it, the normal Blinka test worked fine, but then... Um, at um, Maker Melissa's suggestion, I tried Pulsin, and, and it did not work because it couldn't find a particular library it needed. Um, it turns out that library actually exists. It's actually in the Blinka repository. It just needs to be copied to the right place. And I thought it was going to be a real simple little you know, PR, but I couldn't figure out how to actually do that, and how to, how to set it up for a PR. So there's an issue out there for it. If somebody can take a look at it and figure out, hopefully it's a simple thing, but there's just a couple of little steps that need to be done to um, to make it work. And copy some, uh, you know this file over there and set its permissions properly. But um, it, it does work, and I did was able to actually run the DHT, uh, the evil DHT22 actually worked fine on the 64-bit Raspberry Pi 4. Um, the last thing there's um, I have this board called the, the MakerPy Pico, which is really a nice little development platform, little platform for playing with Raspberry Pi Picos. And uh, one of the ports it has on it is a little slot to stick a, an ESP01S, um, which is an ESP8266 with the AT firmware on it. And so I had this on, oh, hadn't, hadn't played with that in a long time. And I plugged one in and tried it, and lo and behold, it actually works. Um, so it, it's kind of fun. The ESP8266 control library is one that hasn't gotten a lot of attention and probably will not get more attention. 
it's really not supported, but it does work and it's kind of fun to play with. I do, I really do like these MakerPy Pico boards. Nice. That's it. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, next up, we will send it over to Katni. Hello. So last week, I finished up my CircuitPython 2022 post, um, got that published, uh, published the Arcade QT guide. That's a board that's been out for a bit, but we uh, hadn't gotten to the guide um, yet, but pe folks have been asking for the examples to go with it because um, it's a little bit uh, complicated of a board. Um, it, run it runs the AT Tiny 817 using Seesaw, and so you have to know what pins things are on, and this guide obviously tells you everything you need to know. Um, I ran into issues with Arduino on the Arcade QT, um, which turned into a lot of troubleshooting. It turns out it may do clock stretching, which makes it not work on certain boards. The only boards I had with me are a little bit weird in Arduino. Um, but it also had some issues on CMD boards. Um, so I need next to try it on an actual like AVR board and um, see where that goes. Uh, added content for the upcoming circuitpython.org slash start. That's going to be a link um, on circuitpython.org, obviously, that has some real basic getting started stuff that links to guides, links to other parts of circuitpython.org. Um, but basically thumbs up on, on some level, the welcome to CircuitPython guide plus some extras um, in very short order so folks can find their way around things without um, having to know where to look. And then I uh, started the STEMIQT rev update to the guide for the HT16K337 segment LED backpack. We updated that board to have STEMIQT uh, connectors on it, and so um, that guide needs updating. So this week, the first thing I'm going to be doing is updating the ADXL345 board files on GitHub and in the guide. Uh, the board files that are on there are incorrect, and so Lamore um, put together the current files, and I need to update those um, per a user request. Uh, need to, as I said, make sure the Arcade QT plays nice with a Metro, um, and also see if I can replicate the issues I had on CMD um, because uh, apparently Lamore ran into some issues with the, the testers in the beginning and she just thought it was being flaky and it may actually not be a flaky issue. It may be um, a CMD issue. Uh, continue on the STEM QT rev update for the LED backpack guide. Um, create some learn groups in the late day fruit learn system. I've talked about this for a couple weeks, but it's not uh, top priority, so it's still on my list. Um, basically, there are things called groups that the developers are now making far more um, easy to get to through search. So uh, basically making them more user visible. And so what I can do is put together a welcome to circuit Python group, for example. And then on you know Discord, for example, if if someone is um, giving, uh, or giving support to someone who's new to CircuitPython, you don't have to link to five guides. Um, you'll be able to link to the group, and the group will have all of them in there, and I think that'll be super useful. Um, I still need to get content up on circuitpython.org slash trademarks. Uh, there is a QT guide update for the MCP4725. Um, there's a new ADXL375 that needs a new guide. Um, I still need to do the dot star status LED template um, for... Anne, who's been going through all of the older guides and putting in all the templates, which is super helpful. Thank you for that. Um, I need to do the async I.O. template and then possibly get my README Blender fixed up with Tectrix script. It depends on Eva's got is working on guides right now, and um, those are the priorities. So as soon as those guides are done, um, hopefully we can get that script run and uh, get the README's updated. That's what I've got. Alrighty, Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up is Kmatch. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Okay, so last week I uh, finalized the PR, as mentioned above, about resizing the REPL and uh, uh, placing it uh, where you want it to go. Uh, also found a minor issue in word wrapping in the display text library and submitted a, a proposal to fix that. Uh, next couple items are related to a sort of personal target to make a tablet that can run CircuitPython. Uh, and I came across a rugged uh, conference room scheduler touch display, uh, which is mounted to a wall outside of a room for seeing who's got the room available. Uh, I got a couple of those and wanted to see if those might be good hackable uh, units to do something like this. 
Uh, and I learned a lot about TFTs uh, in the process and some challenges about driving them. Uh, so there's a teardown with a link there. Uh, unfortunately, this one wasn't a good candidate to reuse other than the touch screen. Uh, and so now I'm playing with that. And um, uh, that's related to my work this week. Uh, first off this week, I plan to submit a library for a scrolling text box, wi box widget, where if you have a lot of text and you need to scroll up and down to read it, uh, you can do that. Uh, and then the second one is is to experiment further with the touchscreen responses and how to visualize touches and gestures with the hope of converting individual touch points into gestures like swipe or or rotate or zoom uh, and sort of at a fork in the road whether I continue on with the existing uh, uh, display I uh, sorry Arduino library or do I just go ahead and uh, buckle down and make a start at a, a library for that, that touch panel in CircuitPython. So that's what's going on for this week. All right, thanks, Kim Uh Next up is maker Melissa. Hello, uh, let's see. It's, uh, last week I worked on uh, porting LittleFS to JavaScript some more, uh, continuing on that. Uh, Mostly, I was mostly debugging errors at this point, and uh, I now have an image being generated which has the files extractable, but there's just a couple little things it looks like. Um, so this week I'm going to work on finishing those final bugs, and uh, I'll also be speaking at the Dublin Linux Users Group with Jeff. And that's it. All right, thanks, Melissa. Uh, next up is Tammy Makes Things. Thanks. So last week, I, um, as I mentioned earlier, I got excited about the, the PICU development tool. And so I contributed a PR to add macOS support to that because um, there's some things that work a little differently on a Mac. Um, I also have been building a little helper script because I have several um, boards that you I have a an MCP 22 whatever it is that you use with Blinka and I have an FT 232 and I have a Raspberry Pi Pico running um the U2 IF whatever that firmware is and I was getting tired of having to keep track of which one I was using and setting environment variables so I'm writing a little helper script that probes the USB bus and automatically sets the right environment variable for whichever board is actually present. So I'm trying to finish that up and get it in a place that I can share it. I want to look for more opportunities this week to contribute. And I'm also still getting all of the bits and pieces together to hopefully do my first Twitch stream either this week or the following week, um, focusing on microcontrollers and CircuitPython and hardware hacking and stuff. So that's what I'm working on. And that's it. All right. That's awesome. Thank you, Timmy. Uh, next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, last week, thanks to Katni uh, for getting her CircuitPython 2022 post out. Uh, I read that and went over it over in my deep dive and then also did kind of the wrap-up post on the blog. Um, besides that, I was working on getting the GAT client stuff going. So that's Beely where you're talking to another device that has the data that you want. Um, so to do that, I got service discovery working, so you can discover what things it uh, can can do. I got connecting working, so you can initiate the connection from CircuitPython now. And I got characteristic buffer working, which is what is used in the UART demo. Um, so that's what I got going last week. Over the weekend, I switched to a new DIY keyboard of my own, which is running a custom CircuitPython code. Um, so I'm trying not to get too distracted uh, perfecting that. Uh, but and thinking about how to pl set up the plugins and stuff, so it's pretty extensible and pretty simple as well. Um, this week, uh, the last thing I want to do for for GAT client is getting packet buffer working, which I'm not sure we have a uh, demo for, but I should be able to put one together. Not too, not too difficult. Similar to Echo, but with packet buffer. Um, so I'll get a PR, uh, once I get packet buffer going for GAT client, I'll get a PR out for review and then start on dynamic services going on in Nimble, which is probably going to be a bit more of a trick, uh, but it's just going to be super helpful to be able to do services. So uh, I think it's worth taking a look at. 
So that's my week and probably next week too. Alrighty, thanks, Scott. Uh, next up is Tectric, who is missing the meeting today, so I will read their notes. Uh, Tectric last week worked on a script for fixing library repo readmes, uh, worked on some more missing type annotation PRs. Uh, Tectric submitted a PR for making touchpads iterable on the Circuit Playground library. This allows you to deinit them as needed, which is a bonus. Um, and they also submitted a PR for adding examples on pausing, resuming, and cycling LED animations using push buttons. Uh, this week, Tectric will be working on some, uh, let's see, additional follow through on other PRs that um, were merged this past week. And Tectric also will be working on some more type annotations and anything else that is available in the open issues. So thank you to Tectric for those for sure. Um, and next up is V923Z. Thanks, Tim. So um, in the past two weeks, I, I have uh, completed the implementation of um, a number of um, I.O. utilities in, um, in, in Microlab. So um, <clears throat> this is something that a couple of people have been uh, asking for. Um, basically, you can um, you can now uh, um, write some numerical output uh, on a PC from NumPy to a file, and then you can uh, put it on a microcontroller, and then it, it can be read, uh, and, and vice versa. So uh, you can save uh, measurement data, for example, um, into a file, and this file can be can be done um, um, interpreted uh, by standard NumPy utilities. Um, um, I also fixed an incompatibility issue that uh, Jeff pointed out something like um, half a year ago. Um, and unfortunately, this is a breaking change, uh, the fix, I mean. Um, um, so uh, CircuitPython should probably hold off till uh, version um, 8.0. But if, if there is some, some bug that requires a, a speedy fix, then uh, we can discuss how we would do that without uh, upsetting the, the uh, present API. Um, so in the, in the coming weeks, I would like to uh, um, release version 5.0, uh, which includes these um, uh, above mentioned changes. Um, there are a couple of uh, rough edges still. And I will try to, to clean up the documentation. Um, so um, this is this is mainly for, for uh, circuit Python purposes. Uh, but um, I, I hope that um, this is something that can be done till till uh, version 8.0. Uh, incidentally, I would like to ask, uh, what is the time frame for that? If anyone could comment. Uh, we don't have a time frame, but we'll probably wait for the next version of MicroPython because it will probably okay. rev MPY version. Okay. Um, so Damien, Damien's currently working on the ability to like run code out of the file system MPYs, which is mm -hmm. really cool right. and would reduce our dependence on, on frozen modules. So exactly. that's definitely a mm -hmm. MPY rev. And so I think we're kind of thinking that we'll probably do 8.0 around then. Okay. Okay, great. Well, mm -hmm. uh, with that, I would like to pass it back to, to Tim. Thanks a lot. All right. Yep. Thank you, Zoltan. Um, that gets us to the end of status reports. So we will round out today's meeting with In the Weeds section. Uh, and so as a reminder, In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These can either come out of status updates or they could have been identified ahead of time. If you do have any In the Weeds topics, please make sure uh, to add them into the bottom of the notes document. Go ahead and put your name as well as your topic and we will uh, call folks in the order that they appear in the document. Um, and this week I actually have the, uh, the first one for In the Weeds, and so I was basically just putting a call out to see if there's anyone who is knowledgeable about uh, SSL and HTTPS um, that might be able to help troubleshoot this uh, SSL handshake error that we are getting when we attempt to fetch data from this NASA URL. Um, in the notes doc, I put the URL uh, where we are trying to fetch it from. There's also a uh, historical link into Discord um, back to last week when some of us discussed it a little bit in the help with CircuitPython uh, channel. Um, and it's, it's kind of weird. The, um, it seems fine on a PC browser. Everything comes through and nothing looks you know, too suspect in the, in the header or anything else in the dev tools. Um, but for whatever reason, on CircuitPython, both uh, ESP32S2 
devices as well as ESP32 Spy uh, with the airlift connection. Um, they both seem to fail in a similar way, which ultimately traces back to a SSL handshake error uh, when we add some additional logging into the library. So um, I was just putting that call out to see if there is anybody who is uh, into that SSL world that might have any ideas for troubleshooting. So I don't know if you've talked with Anic data already, but that's one of the people I probably would ask about. Okay, yeah, a little bit. Anic uh Anic data seems pretty knowledgeable. The other person I, I can think of is Brent, actually. Okay. Because um, Brent's done a lot of, like, certificate management and making sure that, like, you have the right keys and stuff. Okay. Yeah, I will, um, I will ask Brent. I think I'll scroll back and check out the history, but I think Anic data maybe was there. Um, they tested some of this for us, I think. Uh, they mm. did the Pi Portal test on the ESP32 spy. Um, but mm -hmm. I'll double check, and then uh, Brent's, Brent's a good resource to ask, so I will do that. Um, and I will mention... Sounds like uh, David might have ideas, too. Yeah, David uh, in the chat mentioned there might be a list of supported... Uh, crypto could be very restrictive on the server side, so I think you mean the um, algorithm that it is using to encrypt it, um, which could be the case. I don't know... Um, yeah. I don't know for yes. sure what they use or what all we support, but that's definitely a good... Uh, a good thing to try to look into to figure out what both of those what we support and what they what they use on the site oh, okay perfect yeah this is how uh, we can uh, really uh, the uh block the, the blo uh i wonder uh bombing guy huh? i wonder if it isn't isn't a block uh the block uh, uh, you might not have the right block cipher Ah, yeah, I think that may be um, that may be what David is suggesting as well. I think just different yeah. uh, term. Okay, so that um, that gives me at least uh, another another stone to go and uh, and turn and look under. So I uh, definitely appreciate folks uh, pointing me in the right direction there. Um, but unless uh, unless anybody has anything else to add on that one, then I think we can go ahead and uh, pass it over to Katni for the next one. Yeah. Um, so this was actually suggested by Jeff, um, but I, like, we keep forgetting about it, I assume, and I thought about it earlier today when, during this meeting. Um, we should consider updating the description on the long-term milestone in the core to be something like, while these issues are not a priority for Adafruit, we would absolutely love to have the community pick them up. Um, the idea being that um, we should uh, make it clear that they're not like we're not putting off those issues because nobody should do them and if someone wants to pick them up we're we're happy to help um i don't know how we can get that into a concise sentence um but if if that's something that we think we want to do i'm happy to try and put something together so i don't know what what anybody else thinks about that i think it sounds like a great idea okay i will um I will think on that then. Um, so yeah, so that's that's good enough for that. Um, the next thing I have is, um, as I discussed in my CircuitPython 2022 post, I want to see us do a call for input from the community more than once per year. Um, I think it'll help keep the community more involved with the evolution of CircuitPython versus only um, soliciting input one time per year. Um, spreading it out about three times would be about the end of April, beginning of May, and then I thought we could do one for CircuitPython day. Um, the two, the, the second two don't need to be as involved as this call, um, as in like we don't necessarily need to do, you know, weekly posts on who's posted what and all of that stuff. We can, if we want to, do a roundup post at the end. Um, that's quick and easy, uh, and nobody should feel obligated to respond really to any of them, including the New Year one. Um, but what do people think about those two times ish um, to just put out uh, to to actually be verbal about it? Because obviously we're happy to take you know input at any time, um, but not everybody knows that. I think Circuit Python Day makes a lot of sense, and if you think more than that, then I I would support that too. Okay. I'm just, um, my year is fragmented, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, if you, for this year, you, you're, you're not in... <laughs> you're not necessarily part of this, I know. Yeah. Um, but in general, um, 
do, because I mean, I know a lot of the folks that are in this meeting are, are people who responded. Um, would you be interested in providing input again, um, either one or two more times per year? CircuitPython day for sure, I think would be a great time to do it. Um, but as long as folks are interested in that, that's something that I would um, be happy to handle. Well, I was kind of the one who um, mentioned this to Katni first, so I think mm -hmm. it's a good idea. I won't necessarily have different ideas um, in April, but it's more about wanting to hear other people's ideas right. and putting out the ask and seeing what uh, comes out of the woodwork and then hopefully encouraging the community to work on those things because, you know, the other thing is we've all got plenty on our plates. <laughs> That is true. And what I see happening is the more that we add to CircuitPython, which we do very, like we've been doing a lot more, um, a lot more quickly, I think it'll spark more ideas from other folks. Like that's, that's kind of what I see. Like right now, I don't think I would have new ideas in April either. But, you know, based on what we add to CircuitPython between now and then, I may say, oh, you know, hey, that sparked this idea that I had. Um, and, and I'm hoping that's kind of what will come out of this. So, okay, sounds good. Um, I will pick, um, if I want to do it again in April or May, um, I'll pick a day for that. And then definitely we'll do CircuitPython Day, um, which we, because we do a bunch of leading up to that anyway. So just adding in, hey, we're looking for another call for input um, will be rather easy to do. Um, and again, I will deal with that. Okay, that's what I've got. All thank right. you, Katni. Yeah, thank you, Katni, for sure. Um, and that is our last topic for In the Weeds. So we will do a wrap up and then head off for the day. Um, so thank you to everyone that participated uh, or everyone listening or watching after the fact. This has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for February the 7th, 2022. Um, thank you again to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, please consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be made available on major podcast services. Uh, it will also be featured in the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held uh, Monday, as usual, next week. The 14th is at the normal time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific. Uh, however, it is worth noting the following week, uh, I believe, is going to be on a Tuesday. So not next week, but the week after, I believe we're bumping to the Tuesday. So uh, we hope to see everybody next Monday for the normally scheduled meeting and then the following Tuesday for that week's. Um, this meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. And that is going to be it for today. We hope to see you all again next week, and thank you again to everyone. Thanks, everyone. All right.